Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. In this video, I'm going to be asking a very interesting question. Are both Sony and Microsoft working on portable console next generation hardware? Based upon rumors and information that I've personally been hearing, the answer is quite possibly yes. Today's sponsor is Surfshark VPN, a mobile app and a desktop web browser extension which allows you to change your virtual location with ease. The use for this is flexible. It could be as simple as protecting your privacy on a public Wi-Fi connection, a general level of extra security, or, perhaps most popular of all, changing your geolocation so you can unlock your favorite shows on Netflix and other streaming services. It's no secret that the catalog of Netflix changes based upon your location, so many films and shows are not available to everyone. For example, you can't access Marvel movies on the UK Netflix, but you can do this easily with Surfshark, and you can change your location to the US or other regions with a simple click or tap of a button. For those of you who are located in the US, you can even change the state that you reside in so that you can access services like HBO Max. With over 3,200 servers in 65 countries, you'll find a server which fits your content needs and truly unlock the full potential of your streaming services. For those with security on the mind, Surfshark has a strict no-logs policy, meaning that no matter what, your data will not be collected. The app can also fool other Android apps that get a bit nosy about your location thanks to GPS spoofing. Just click the link in the description below and use the promo code REDGAMINGTECH for a huge 83% off and an extra three months completely free. And while that might sound a little crazy on the surface, particularly given that the PlayStation Vita, for example, didn't exactly sell gangbusters, there are a multiple reasons that this could well be the case. So we're going to be discussing that in this video. Now, I will say I have been hearing more about the Sony side of things uh, here, but we will be touching on Microsoft, particularly towards the end segment of the video. So if you're not so interested in Sony, well, you can do the normal thing and, you know, skip to the relevant sections that interest you. Now, I will also mention that one of the folks who told me about this actually gave me a lot of information back in the day regarding the Switch Pro. And while we haven't actually seen the Switch Pro be released, I mean, in fact, Nintendo multiple times at this point have denied the existence of a follow-up Switch system, it kind of has been confirmed, uh, including the details that I leaked quite some time ago, by, uh, well, the NVIDIA hack. And we'll get more into uh, a little bit anyway about Nintendo and uh, NVIDIA later on in this video as we're kind of rounding things up. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, there's a ton of things that are happening in the industry. One of the really big ones, of course, is the fact that Valve have recently released the Steam Deck. And I think we can all agree that the Steam Deck has been met with a really positive reception. Um, and while it's certainly not perfect, there are a lot of issues with compatibility, particularly with some Windows titles. Obviously, the OS isn't natively Windows that's, you know, preloaded on the machine. Ultimately, it is a really popular system. Now, this is not to say that, and we're going to focus for a moment on the uh, Sony side of things, that the... PlayStation hardware has only just entered the design phase. To my understanding, it was late 2019 to early 2020 that Sony really started to take this seriously. And there have been multiple designs and or, let's say, approaches discussed within Sony regarding the hardware. As I mentioned earlier, while the PlayStation Vita didn't exactly sell the best, I mean, honestly, compared to, let's say, how the Xbox 360 sold, or the PlayStation 2, or what have you, the Vita, in many eyes, could be seen as a failure. But what the Vita did have is a really high software attach rate. For those who don't know, and I'm sure most of you do, it basically means that the higher the software attach rate, the more games on average 
an individual purchased if they own that console. So for example, a higher attach rate would be 10 games rather than five games. And in the case of the PlayStation Vita, as you can see, according to these numbers anyway, the Vita did have a pretty good attach rate. And this is despite, despite excuse me, the fact that piracy on the Vita was pretty rampant. Um, as well as I believe the PlayStation Portable, but honestly, I don't know as much about that system. So it's quite interesting, honestly, because one of the things that I've been hearing is that if this is true, and I want to stress if, it does actually apparently connect with the PlayStation Portable device. And, you know, while that might sound a little crazy, think about it just, you know, outside the technical side of things for a moment, from a software attach rate and... I suppose the best way of describing it is just getting someone into the ecosystem because you're really getting someone to spend, assuming they do actually jump into the ecosystem, quite a bit of cash. And it does also have a ton of other potential as well. And it will be really interesting because potentially you could even, for example, stream from your PlayStation 5. Now, I do believe as well, Sony in the longer term are working on PlayStation 5 Pro hardware. And we've discussed this multiple times. And Microsoft too are, of course, working on next generation Xbox hardware. In fact, there's even been a new code name, which does seem to be associated with new Xbox hardware. And we'll be discussing that later on in the video. So let's be really clear about this guys this hardware has not been announced and projects in the game industry get cancelled all of the time we know games for example scale bound have been cancelled we you know what there's just so many instances in the the you know even games or projects which have gone really far into development they can't. I mean, one of the one of the really classic examples, if you're into uh, PC gaming, is the RX 490, which is pretty old now, but we almost are certain that it exists because there were multiple leaks, even benchmarks of the bloody performance of the GPU. It was basically the RX 480, albeit with more compute units. We saw multiple vendors even list it. We saw, I believe, even the drivers pop up briefly on the AMD website. But then it was cancelled, and allegedly it's because AMD wanted to focus Polaris on the mid-range, and Vega, of course, was going to be the high-performance card, so basically the 490 got cancelled. So, you know, at the end of the day, this has not been confirmed by Sony, but I do believe that multiple iterations of the hardware are being tested internally. Also, given the fact that the initial kind of project again to what i'm hearing started in 2020 early period of 2020 like you know console design life cycles take a long time it's usually four to five years and of course we've seen that from microsoft we've even seen that back in the day with like you know uh, nintendo and sega consoles take quite a long time to bring up so i don't expect us to see anything on store shelves until 2024 at the earliest also to my understanding this is not a knee-jerk reaction to anything specific in the industry so this is sony you know just kind of going about their original plan of course this is not to say that they're not flexible and they can see the direction of the winds but i don't think sony have just suddenly started to panic because they heard mur murmurs of what valve have been doing with this said i would also imagine that the success of what they've seen with let's say the nintendo switch and also now probably are being spurred on at the very least partially by the success of valve's steam deck and let's just be honest guys like the steam deck's really cool personally i'm not that you know interested in uh handheld systems personally even with the switch i personally only play it docked but you know in the terms of the market share anyway you can't argue that it is being really successful and i've been hearing that the sales of the um system are absolutely ludicrous in fact valve have already essentially confirmed that there will be follow-ups to the system which makes sense because ultimately it's basically a pc in a handheld let's just be totally honest and this is really important because pc hardware specs obviously continue to evolve i guess it's pretty logical for us to discuss potential specifications 
Sony and Microsoft have extremely close ties to AMD, so could benefit extensively from highly customized designs, maximizing every square millimeter of silicon space. I've heard a couple of sources tell me slightly different things. While both have said that Sony are working on a new PlayStation Portable, Source 1 told me that it's based on an AMD GPU, but they believe that it's based on an ARM CPU for quote, power reasons. Source 2 said that Sony are partnering with AMD. They didn't know specifics, but probably it was based upon a custom Zen CPU, although fewer cores than, say, the PlayStation 5. However, it was still using RDNA-based graphics IP. So clearly, Source 1 and 2 have contradicted one another here. Therefore, logically, either one or both are incorrect, but possibly this is confused information possibly because of multiple designs being considered. I want to stress though, Microsoft and Sony heavily customized their silicon for their hardware. And we've seen this of course with the Xbox One, the Xbox Series X, the PlayStation 5, the PS4, and so on and so on. So they customize this silicon more than a laptop vendor would or even Steam has with Steam Deck. Steam Deck is 15 to 20 watts in terms of its power consumption, although this is inclusive of the screen. Valve's handheld is also outfitted with four cores, eight threads, based on Zen 2, with eight RDNA-based uh, uh, compute units, and modest-ish clock frequencies. Later APUs, such as Rembrandt and the Ryzen 6900HS, offer significant power and performance and scaling advantages not found in Steam Deck and its Aerith APU, which is a custom design loosely based on AMD's Van Gogh. We'll look more at this in just a moment. I was also told for ARM that Qualcomm had actually approached Sony to supply parts for a console design. Honestly though, I don't know if it went anywhere. I don't know if the talks were successful. This source has been really accurate for stuff previously, especially NVIDIA related and some things AMD, but this is predominantly PC stuff. But let's assume that the discussions did take place. And honestly, um, again, my source has been pretty accurate. Honestly, discussions like this happen in business all of the time. And I think it would take a lot for Sony or Microsoft actually to move away from AMD because Honestly, AMD are just really robust in terms of their upcoming uh, roadmap on both CPUs and GPUs. I was also told by two people that the Vita successor will work with the PS VR2. Clearly, there are challenges here. Predominantly, you need enough GPU performance to drive the displays, power, uh, of course, to actually run all of this, and a user experience. All of this is going to be key. We'll talk more about that, though, in just a moment. Now, I want to be clear what's upcoming is speculation, not part of this leak. But if Sony went x86, they'll certainly use Zen 3 or a later design. In my opinion, four to six cores would be the sweet spot. For example, see what happened with Steam Deck. And this starts to make further sense if we look at the design timelines we're seeing for the console. Again, to reiterate, initial plans started in late 2019, possibly early 2020. And consoles generally have a gestation period. They take usually three to five years to take shape and see a release. Now, ARM does have a ton of options with many vendor designs to choose from. And of course, they are very low power. And naturally, AMD's RDNA graphics IP can run just fine with non-X86 processors. For example, Samsung's Exynos uses versions of ARM V9A. This is combined with AMD's RDNA 2 graphics IP for the 2022 versions. But given the consoles are not launching this year, we don't have a design which is currently available to test and provide us direct insight into what's possible. The Rembrandt-based 6900HS is a Ryzen CPU um, created on TSMC's 6NM process. Ultimately, it uses RDNA 2 and Zen 3 Plus. We could presume, however, that Sony's handheld, because remember, it's going to be a couple of years into the future, would likely use 3, 4, or 5NM. In my personal opinion, the first two of those is more likely. 
And of course, naturally, we also see future CPU and GPU IPs not only have significant power um, uh, advantages, but also performance advantages as well, basically IPC gains. So with this said, we do still have the 6900HS. It's not a perfect example of what's possible, but it does give us some insight. Free NM is a 70% increase in logic density and 30% power reduction over 5NM low, whereas 5NM from the company, that's TSMC, reduces power consumption about 40% over uh, the 7NM process. Now remember the um, 6900HS is produced using uh, the 6NM process of TSMC, which is basically an enhanced 7NM. Anantech did a really good write-up, actually, of power and frequency scaling of the 6900HS. And, of course, this design is highly configurable. As a general rule, of course, higher power and heat budgets lead to higher clock frequencies. So a 15 to 20 watt power window for CPU clocks here, you can see, well, it's between 1800 and 2500 megahertz. This is being tested with a highly demanded CPU application with eight of the cores, that's all of the cores of the 6900 fully pegged. Assuming RDNA is the graphics IP though, continuing with our 6900HS example, it's outfitted with 12 GPU cores. So that's 768 shaders and it runs at 2.4 gigahertz with an asterisk, we'll get into that in just a second. So this GPU on paper is capable of around 3.6 teflops of performance. But yeah, getting back to that asterisk, that's with higher TDP configurations. So if the CPU and GPU is at full load, honestly, it would just be way too power hungry. There's no way that a battery would last that long. So probably here we're going to be looking at paired back clock frequencies for the GPU and CPU. But remember, we're talking about a future design. Now, AMD's future graphics IPs launched this year. The company have already confirmed RDNA 3 is coming this year and have also confirmed Zen 4 as well publicly. We can assume at decent performance gains, assuming Sony would use this and logically given a handheld, if it does launch, is going to be like 2024 onwards. So I feel personally a 4 or 6 core Zen 3 or Zen 4, again Zen 4 launches in desktop this year, so I think Zen 4 is quite likely, with an AMD graphics IP on a later TSMC node could provide a ton of handheld grunt, probably close to 4 teflops, honestly. I would also expect SmartShift to see a return. Assuming that Sony are doing this, it just makes sense. They've leveraged it for the PlayStation 5, and honestly, Sony have a habit of taking lessons from previous designs and enhancing them. SmartShift directly um, adjusts power between the CPU and GPU as needed. It doesn't take temperature in the PS5 anyway into account. It's simply uh, power consumption. So taking this approach with a handheld is just logical. And SmartShift, frankly, it's not a big guess. Sony are not the only ones who have used this. It's, of course, been part and parcel of, well, pretty much all of AMD's more recent and successful laptops and even Valve for Steam Deck. I also feel logically that there's going to have to be a really robust caching system. This not only reduces memory bandwidth demands, such as wider buses and faster clocks, eating more power, and also more expensive in terms of the design itself. Remember, um, not only does the memory bus itself, if it's wider, require more memory chips and actually more space on the PCB, more power consumption, but you also need to have more memory controllers on the die. It's a whole thing. But also, more robust caching would improve other things. For example, it could reduce the uh, penalty for cache misses. And again, power consumption could be a really big fact here. Um, I suspect that we're going to see like CPU and GPU unified memory and stuff like that, but that's all guesses. Ultimately, the big problem with these guesses, though, is we don't know Sony's end goal of the device. Assuming it's real, what would they do? Would they create a Nintendo Switch style console, i.e. it's not top specification even at launch, or would they go with bleeding edge? 
Another big point, Sony seems to be actively investing tons of research and development into upscaling technologies. We've already publicly seen ray tracing reconstruction videos from Sony, and this actually matches really closely with some leaks that I've put out for uh, the ray tracing performance and reconstruction research within Sony regarding the PlayStation 5 Pro. And again, yeah, it's, it's all kind of interesting. Ultimately, how this works as well with the PlayStation VR 2 is a mystery. Assuming it really does work with the PSVR 2, which I think it's already been confirmed in public as a single cable anyway, I mean, really, when you think about it, the base PS4 ran PSVR 1 just fine, and presumably this handheld would be multiple times more powerful. I would assume that, however, the games would be visually paired back in scope and complexity, probably exclusive titles for this system, um, compared to, let's say, the PS5, uh, which was running the PSVR 2, though. That's, again, assuming that that is actually true. I also want to say that I don't think Sony are, like, you know, special snowflakes here. I have been told Microsoft are considering their own handheld device as well. Now, the way it was explained to me, this could have already been canned. So I want you to take this with a pinch of salt, but I want to explore this because I find it perhaps provides more context to what's happening at Sony. And also there've been a couple of other interesting things that have happened as well. Now, two individuals have explained to me that Microsoft are considering an Xbox handheld. One of those also told me about the PlayStation design as well. Um, but apparently the console, that is Microsoft's system, seems to set around Xbox One X levels. But this is really early preliminary stuff, and I also think that there are multiple design iterations, much like Sony. I also think that this statement is not in reference to the T-flops or anything like that. I think it's actually more in reference to the clock frequencies probably of the CPU, which again provides some context in possibly the direction Sony were going with its handheld, assuming that A, the handheld is real, and that B, they're going with AMD. Logically though, you know, if you look at the existence of the Xbox Series S, it's a 40 flop G, uh, GPU machine, 8 Zen 2 cores and about 10 gigabytes of RAM and SSD and a bunch of other stuff. Really, in a couple of years' time, I don't think it's that impossible for Microsoft to basically take this design and shrink it down to a handheld form, possibly with some concessions to the design, yes, but you don't need necessarily four T-flops of raw performance. Remember, the screen is going to be smaller, right? Like, it's going to be 720p or whatever. I feel that it's quite possible that Microsoft could have a device which would closely mimic Xbox One hardware, possibly backwards compatibility, or maybe the machine would have its own exclusive titles. I also want to say that one of the obvious things people are going to say, uh, point out in the comments is like, well, dude, Microsoft and Sony, then what are they doing? It sounds like they're essentially the same machine. And I mean, if you've been following, you know, tech for any of them for time or just the console market, that's probably not too much of a surprise to you. The thing is, Microsoft with the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4 and the Series X and the PlayStation 5, yes, there were divergences in the, you know, graphics IP, for example, between the Xbox One and the, you know, uh, PS4 or the CPU clock frequency, like, for example, the Xbox One X had higher clock frequency than the PS4 Pro, whatever. But basically speaking, they're, you know, kind of dancing around the same song, really. And because Sony and Microsoft have huge insight, they actually directly impact the direction that AMD goes with its hardware. I really want to stress this, guys. Like, think of it just from Microsoft's perspective, just for one second. Microsoft literally create DirectX for the PC. I mean, sure, there are other massive considerations AMD has as well. I'm pretty sure that... For the Sony side of things, from what I understand, Sony were a really big part of AMD pushing ray tracing in RDNA 2, for example. And, of course, Microsoft really pushed things like, you know, um, mesh shaders and all this other stuff. 
it's just kind of how they all work together because Microsoft and Sony, although they are in competition in, with one another in many ways, they also do have huge insight into uh, AMD's roadmap. So the fact is, like, you know, they're going to kind of come to very similar conclusions when AMD are approaching Microsoft, for example, or Sony and saying, look, these are what we're working on in terms of our CPUs. This is where we think we're going to be hitting in performance targets. This is going to be our core count. This is going to be the IPC gains. This is what TSMC are doing. This is what this fab is doing. Microsoft can really figure this stuff out, as can Sony. Um, and, you know, adding to all of this, you've probably seen about the reports of Xbox Keystone. So this is an Xbox project, and it was, you know, kind of doing the rounds in the news. Now, I want to stress that this could be entirely separate to the handheld. In fact, it could very well not even be a console. For all we know, it could be a design that's completely dead at this point. And I've mentioned already that Sony are working on a PlayStation 5 Pro. And there's growing evidence, of course, that this is the case. We've already seen new patents from Sony which show ray tracing hardware in a Sony product that literally is not part of the PS5. It's just, it's just not. It's not part of AMD's RDNA 2 graphics IP, which is what Sony, Microsoft, and AMD are using for this current generation. So either Sony have like ridiculous um, ray tracing technology that just has not been uncovered yet and completely contradicts all of the previous Sony patents for the PS5 or its brand new hardware. And I'm pretty sure we can all agree that, you know, new hardware is probably where we're going. So I believe Microsoft are already working on follow-up designs to the Series X as well. To my understanding, there's several designs being considered, so Keystone could be one of those designs and not the handheld. Another possibility with Keystone, do you guys remember before the Xbox Series X and stuff were officially announced, there were those rumors of a streaming stick which would plug into your TV, a bit like an Amazon Fire Stick or a Chromecast. And as you can imagine, this would be for like xCloud. So it's possible that's what Keystone is. And given that xCloud is very popular right now, it's a tremendous avenue of growth within Microsoft. But with all this said, it's not necessarily the best solution for travel. In the UK, for example, some of our underground lines for, you know, I guess you guys would call it like the Metro or Subway if you're in the States. Well, <laughs> the signal sucks. And in other areas with poor internet access or limited data caps, this is not really going to work. I would love to see Microsoft work on this device. I think it could be really cool, but it also could be incorrect information. Or again, the design canned. I've also no new updates on the Switch Pro. I've had it leaked that it did exist and provided several updates to the hardware and actually wrote articles before it was reported by others even. Multiple sources had confirmed to me it was real, based on newer NVIDIA graphics IP, had multiple advancements for the Switch Pro, or whatever it ended up being called, including the usage of NVIDIA's DLSS upsampling technology. Allegedly, Nintendo and NVIDIA had some kind of PR slash co-development agreement with DLSS. This is seemingly confirmed, quote unquote, with a more recent NVIDIA hack. While this seemed to prove some of my leaks right and seemed to confirm that the Switch hardware, or at least this version of it, would run with and peer for its graphics IP, it could also, funny enough, be canned. Now, I'm not sure why. I first leaked about this hardware and then I'd also confirmed from multiple sources that the dev kits were being used internally. They were being tested by Nintendo's own, well, testers. But then, for some reason, the internal Nintendo testers had the hardware taken away from them. And to my understanding, to my knowledge right now, and I could be wrong on this, it has not been replaced with an alternative kit. Although I believe that the Switch Pro also had a couple of different versions, a couple of different, you know, iterations of hardware. So I do think Nintendo were pretty angry at NVIDIA for the hack because it did kind of confirm the hardware, but 
these kits were taken away prior to this and honestly you can't blame uh, nvidia for being hacked it's not like their password was something like abc123 so there we have it i am really interested honestly if sony is going this route as well as microsoft um i think it's fair to say that console hardware has really changed in direction and honestly microsoft i feel are definitely becoming emboldened in the industry right now while many you know weren't super happy with the xbox series s in terms of like you know the performance side of things a lot felt that it would have been better to have only one hardware fixed specification initially at launch i can say that and you know we've seen this quite quite evidently from sales and stuff that the series s is doing quite well and i personally know quite a few people who bought a playstation 4 or playstation 5 and then bought a series s just because it's like so cheap um and this is particularly true in the current market conditions like you know <laughs> stuff is expensive yo um so i mean from the microsoft side of things you could imagine how a device a handheld device could really just be kind of nuts um just essentially just incredible from the game pass perspective um and for sony as well there are a ton of different tie-ins that sony could achieve here and with all of the stuff we've seen with sony with the upsampling technology and so on It'll be really interesting. Now, personally, until I actually see something more in my hands, so to speak, um, I'm going to have a degree of skepticism here. Uh, but with that said, and obviously I don't want to attribute stories to certain individuals, the person who told me the uh, uh, PlayStation thing has had a really good track record with PC leaks. Um, and yeah... Again, another person who told me some of this stuff had also told me some stuff regarding the Switch Pro, which again has turned out to be accurate. Again, though that individual is generally more PC focused, um, but it is still really interesting. So I'm going to be super curious to see what happens out of all of this. Um, I think that the next generation of hardware you know even if you discount handhelds is going to be kind of bonkers the xbox series x and playstation 5 are really starting to hit their stride at the moment there is a ton of absolutely awesome things i think when we start to see ue5 really start to take advantage of the geometry engine and the playstation 5 and mesh shaders on the on the xbox series systems um, and other game engines like it it will be really cool honestly with that said thank you very much for checking out the video and if you have enjoyed it you know what to do. Leave a likey and all of that stuff. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.